Imagine discovering your child isn't yours, after 15 years of raising her. One moment shattered his world, and nothing will ever be the same. Stay tuned to hear how a simple smile unraveled an entire family. It was unusual for me to be working on a Saturday. The only reason I found myself in Cleveland today was to assist with a special request from one of our clients, Julie, a longtime customer. I work for a manufacturing company called Everline Technologies. We specialize in producing industrial grade communication equipment, telephones designed and not for everyday use, but for extreme and hazardous environments. These phones are built to withstand the toughest conditions, they're explosion proof, water resistant, and can survive environments where most equipment would fail. Our biggest clients include oil refineries, manufacturing plants, and offshore drilling platforms, places where reliable communication is a matter of safety. Today, I have been called to resolve a minor issue at a large grain elevator just outside the city. The problem had been straightforward, and I was finished earlier than expected. Before heading back to Pittsburgh, I stopped to fill up my gas tank, thinking about how I'd spend the rest of my weekend. That's when something unexpected happened. Ted Marshall What brings you down here on a Saturday? A familiar voice interrupted my thoughts. It was Lisa Jacobs, an old family friend. Lisa and her husband Kevin used to live near Pittsburgh, and we'd gotten to know each other over the years, attending social events together now and then. It had been a while since I'd seen her, and it was a pleasant surprise. Lisa I'm just here for a few hours, doing a little work over in Akron, I replied with a smile. How've you been? We chatted for about ten minutes, catching up on life and reminiscing about old times. Before I knew it, Lisa had invited me over to their house for a family barbecue. Their home wasn't far from where I was, and I had the rest of the day free, so I agreed to join them. Lisa was originally from Columbus, and her husband Kevin's family hailed from Cleveland. Most of the people at the barbecue were Kevin's relatives, and they welcomed me warmly. After a while, I called my wife, Laura, to let her know where I was. She and Lisa caught up on the phone, and after about ten minutes of chatting, I felt better about staying a bit longer. The barbecue was a relaxed, uneventful affair for the most part, but something caught my attention. As I mingled with Kevin's family, I noticed a peculiar trait that seemed to run through the entire group. Kevin's father, his two brothers, and even their children all had the same unique smile. A canine tooth on the right side of their mouths jutted out slightly, and when they smiled, their lips would curl up around the tooth, giving them all a playful, almost mischievous grin. It was striking to see so many people with the same characteristic, especially when they were all together. My curiosity got the better of me, and I approached Lisa, who was busy tending to the food. Lisa, I have to ask, what's the deal with that distinctive smile everyone in Kevin's family has? She laughed. Oh, you noticed. It's hard to miss when you get them all together, isn't it? It's a family trait, Kevin, his brothers, his dad, and now the kids all have it. It's this little quirk of genetics. They've passed it down from one generation to the next. It's kind of cute, don't you think? I nodded, smiling, though I found the whole thing more intriguing than cute. After that, I let Lisa get back to her hosting duties. But on my drive back to Pittsburgh, the image of that smile kept lingering in my mind, and it got me thinking. My wife, Laura, and I had been married for 22 years. I met her in college, and we hit it off right from the start. After graduation, I landed a job with Everline Technologies, where I've been working for the past 20 years. We have two children, twin boys, Ryan and Rob, who are 19 now and heading to college in the fall. And then there's our daughter, Lily, who's 15. She's the light of our lives, full of energy and always keeping us on our toes. We live a comfortable life in a nice house just outside the city, with two cars and a solid retirement plan in the works. In just one more year, I'll be fully vested in the company's pension plan, and we have a healthy savings account to boot. Over the years, the company has asked me to relocate several times, 
but Laura has always been firmly against it. Aside from that, we've gotten along well enough. Our marriage hasn't been full of fireworks, but it's been steady and reliable. But as I drove home that day, something was nagging at me. It was something I hadn't thought much about before, but now it was hard to ignore. Our intimacy, once passionate and exciting, had cooled significantly around the time Lily was born. I had chalked it up to the natural progression of a long marriage. Laura had never refused me, but the spark was gone. I had grown accustomed to our routine, assuming it was just part of getting older. But now, I wasn't so sure. When I arrived home, Laura had prepared a light dinner, knowing I wouldn't be very hungry after the barbecue. She asked how everything went, and we made small talk about the day. Our daughter, Lily, sat across from me, quietly eating. The boys were out, probably off doing whatever teenage boys do. Everything was normal, until Lily looked up and smiled. Her right lip curled ever so slightly around her canine tooth, in a way that was all too familiar. That same pixie-like grin I had seen on Kevin's family flashed across my daughter's face. My heart sank, and suddenly, I wasn't hungry anymore. I excused myself from the table, my mind racing. There was no mistaking it, Lily's smile was identical to the one Kevin's family had. It wasn't a coincidence. As I lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling, memories flooded back. Around the time Laura became pregnant with Lily, things between us had started to change. Our relationship, once warm and affectionate, had grown distant. I had tried to brush it off at the time, blaming it on the stresses of parenthood and the demands of our jobs. Laura never denied me intimacy, but the passion had faded. I had learned to live with it, assuming it was just part of being married for a long time. But now, seeing that familiar grin on Lily's face, everything began to fall into place. It wasn't just the natural ebb and flow of a marriage, there was something more. Something deeper. My thoughts turned to Laura's frequent trips to Cleveland over the years. She had always gone alone, telling me they were to visit her old friends or attend business conferences. But now I couldn't help but wonder if there had been another reason. The more I thought about it, the more convinced I became. Lily wasn't my daughter. She was Kevin's. I've never been the confrontational type, but I knew I had to address this with Laura. Hundreds of questions buzzed through my head, and by the time the sun rose, I had barely slept a wink. I decided to wait until the right moment, hoping I could bring it up without causing a complete breakdown. After all, I loved Lily, even if she wasn't biologically mine. But the betrayal, if true, was something I wasn't sure I could overlook. That evening, Laura had prepared a simple dinner. She always knew when I had eaten too much the day before, so she kept things light. After dinner, as we sipped coffee, I decided it was time. The boys were out again, and Lily had already excused herself to go to her room. It was just the two of us. Laura, I started slowly, there's something that's been on my mind lately. And I think we need to talk about it. She looked at me, her expression soft but curious. What's wrong, Ted? I took a deep breath. How long are we going to wait before we tell Lily who her real father is? For a moment, the room was completely silent. Laura's face went pale, and her hands froze around her coffee cup. She didn't say a word, but her expression told me everything I needed to know. After what felt like an eternity, she sighed deeply and looked down at the table. I was wondering how long it would take you to figure it out, she said quietly, her voice calm but resigned. I felt my chest tighten. So it's true. She nodded, avoiding my gaze. Yes. Kevin is Lily's biological father. I sat there, stunned. Even though I had already suspected the truth, hearing it confirmed left me feeling hollow. I had raised Lily as my own for fifteen years, never doubting she was mine. And now, everything I thought I knew had been appended. How long has this been going on? I asked, my voice low, trying to keep calm. Laura finally looked up at me, 
her eyes filled with regret but not the kind of remorse I expected. It started about sixteen years ago, she admitted. Kevin and I, it just happened. It was a mistake, but it went on longer than it should have. Longer than it should have? I repeated, feeling my anger rising. How long, Laura? She hesitated before answering. We stayed in touch after Lily was born. I didn't want to hurt you, and I thought it was better for everyone if we just, left things the way they were. Kevin agreed. We both figured it was easier this way. Easier? My mind raced. The woman I had loved for over two decades had been lying to me for half of our marriage, and now she was talking about it like it was some minor inconvenience. And Lily? When were you planning on telling her? Or were you just going to keep this secret forever? Laura looked down at her hands again, her fingers fidgeting with her wedding ring. I don't think she needs to know. At least, not yet. She's too young to understand. She doesn't need to know her whole life has been a lie. Not yet? I repeated, incredulous. She's fifteen, Laura. You don't think she deserves to know the truth? We're her family, Ted. She doesn't need to know right now. It's better this way. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I had expected guilt, maybe even an apology, but Laura seemed almost defiant, as if this situation was somehow acceptable to her. I stared at her, trying to comprehend how she could sit there so calmly, as if everything would just go on as usual. You've been lying to me for fifteen years, I said slowly, and now you're asking me to keep lying to Lily. It's for her own good, Laura said softly, still refusing to meet my eyes. You don't understand. Telling her now would only hurt her. What good would it do? The urge to lash out rose inside me, but I swallowed it down. I couldn't think clearly, not with everything swirling in my head. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow move in the hallway. My heart sank. Lily had overheard us. I heard her footsteps retreating quickly, and I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. I stood up from the table, my decision made. I'm not going to keep lying, Laura. I'll move into the guest room tonight. And I think we need to talk about divorce. Laura's calm demeanor finally cracked. Divorce? Ted, that's not necessary. We can still live together. I'm not interested in pretending anymore, I cut her off. I'll be moving my things tonight. With that, I left the kitchen, heading upstairs to pack my things. I had never thought of myself as someone who would consider divorce, but in that moment, I couldn't imagine staying in the same house, much less the same bed, with the woman who had betrayed me so completely. That night, I moved into the guest room. It wasn't much, just a small, uncomfortable sofa bed and a dresser, but it was better than sharing a room with Laura. The thought of staying in our bedroom, the place where we had shared our lives for so long, was unbearable. I woke up early the next morning, long before anyone else was stirring in the house. I didn't want to face Laura or deal with any questions from the kids. So I left before dawn, grabbing a quick breakfast at a diner near my office. At work, I struggled to focus. My mind kept replaying the events of the previous night. I had never been the type to seek revenge or act out of anger, but the more I thought about Laura's betrayal, the more I felt I needed to do something, something to protect myself, my children, and my future. I didn't want to support Laura and Kevin's affair, financially or otherwise. The first thing that came to mind was the boys. Ryan and Rob were already in college, and while they were young adults now, I didn't want them to get caught in the middle of this mess. And then there was Lily. Even though she wasn't biologically mine, I still loved her deeply and didn't want to hurt her. I couldn't let my anger toward Laura spill over and affect my relationship with Lily or the boys. Over the next couple of days, I avoided any conversations with Laura. I spent most of my time in the garage, working on small projects that had been sitting on the back burner for years. I was just trying to keep myself occupied while figuring out my next move. Then, on Sunday evening after dinner, 
I decided to confront Laura again. The boys had gone out with their friends, and Lily had retreated to her room. It was the perfect moment to talk without causing a scene. Laura, I began as we sat in the quiet living room, I've been thinking about everything. I can't keep pretending like nothing happened. I want a divorce. Laura set her coffee cup down and sighed. Ted, you're overreacting. We've built a life together, and we have the kids to think about. A divorce would tear this family apart. No, Laura. You tore this family apart when you started lying to me fifteen years ago, I said, my voice firm but calm. I can't stay in this marriage, knowing what I know now. She remained silent for a long time before finally speaking. What about the kids? What about Lily? Lily will be fine. She's stronger than you think. But she deserves the truth, even if it's hard for her to hear. Laura shook her head. We've had a stable life for years. Telling her the truth now would only destroy everything. I think we should wait. Let her finish high school. Let her get older before we say anything. I knew where this was going. Laura wasn't concerned about Lily's feelings, she was concerned about maintaining the status quo. She was worried about the financial implications, about what her life would look like if our marriage ended. And suddenly, it all became clear. In two years, I would be fully vested in my company's pension plan. Laura knew that if we divorced before then, she wouldn't get a share of it. She was biding her time, waiting until it was financially beneficial for her. Well, I'm not waiting, I replied. I've made my decision. We're getting divorced. Laura's calm facade finally cracked. And what happens then, Ted? How are we supposed to live? How are we going to pay for the boys' college? Do you think you can just walk away and leave everything behind? I stared at her, feeling a mixture of anger and disbelief. We'll figure it out. But I'm not staying in this marriage, Laura. Not after everything you've done. Laura's expression hardened, her calm demeanor giving way to frustration. Ted, be reasonable. We have a life together. You can't just throw it all away over something that happened years ago. I shook my head, feeling the weight of her words but knowing I couldn't back down. This isn't just about the affair, Laura. It's about the lies. You lied to me for years, and you expect me to keep living in this lie. I can't do that. She sighed deeply and leaned back in her chair. Fine. If that's what you want, we'll talk to a lawyer. But I think you're making a mistake. I didn't respond. Instead, I stood up and walked out of the room. I had nothing more to say. The next morning, I called a lawyer and began the process of filing for divorce. It wasn't something I ever thought I'd have to do, but it felt like the only option. As much as it hurt, I knew I couldn't stay in a marriage built on lies and deception. For the next few months, things between Laura and me grew even colder. We kept our conversations to a minimum, communicating only when necessary and always about the kids. Ryan and Rob were busy with college, so they weren't home often, but I still hadn't found the right time to tell them about the divorce. Lily, on the other hand, became even more attached to me. We spent more time together, and I could tell she sensed that something was wrong, even if she didn't fully understand what. One day, while I was working in the garage, Lily came in to see me. She had been quiet lately, and I knew she had overheard at least part of the conversation between Laura and me about her real father. Dad, she began hesitantly, is everything okay? I looked up from the workbench and saw the worry in her eyes. Why do you ask, honey? I don't know, you've been spending a lot of time in the garage, and mom seems upset. Is something going on? I wiped my hands on a rag and motioned for her to sit down. Lily, there's something I need to tell you. It's not easy, and I want you to know that I love you no matter what. She nodded, her eyes wide with concern. The truth is. I'm not your biological father. The words hung in the air, and I could see the shock on her face. What? 
What do you mean, she asked, her voice barely a whisper. Your mom and I, we've had some issues in the past. And it turns out, your biological father is someone else. But that doesn't change how much I love you. I've raised you, and you'll always be my daughter. Lily stared at me, processing the information. I could see the emotions playing out on her face, confusion, hurt, disbelief. Why didn't you tell me before, she asked quietly. I didn't know, I admitted. I only found out recently. And I didn't want to hurt you. But I couldn't keep it from you any longer. Lily stood up abruptly, tears welling in her eyes. I need to go. I watched her leave the garage, my heart heavy. I knew this would be hard for her, but I couldn't lie to her anymore. She deserved the truth, even if it hurt. Later that evening, Laura confronted me. What did you say to Lily? she demanded. I told her the truth, I replied evenly. She deserves to know. You had no right to tell her that, Laura snapped. You just made everything worse. I did what I had to do, I said, my voice calm. We can't keep lying to her. She's old enough to understand. Laura didn't respond, but I could see the anger simmering in her eyes. She turned and walked away, leaving me standing alone in the kitchen. Over the next few days, Lily barely spoke to me or Laura. She spent most of her time in her room, clearly struggling to process everything. I wanted to give her space, but it hurt to see her so upset. I knew this wasn't going to be easy, but I hoped that in time, she would come to understand that I had told her the truth out of love. Meanwhile, the divorce proceedings moved forward. I had consulted with my lawyer, and we began the process of dividing our assets and figuring out the best way to handle the situation with the kids. Ryan and Rob still didn't know about the divorce, and I dreaded having to tell them. They were both away at college, and I didn't want to disrupt their lives any more than necessary. One Sunday evening, after dinner, I decided it was time to break the news to the boys. They were home for the weekend, and I couldn't keep putting it off. We sat down together in the living room, and I took a deep breath before speaking. There's something your mom and I need to talk to you about, I began. We've decided to get a divorce. Ryan and Rob exchanged glances, clearly shocked. What? Why? Ryan asked, his voice full of disbelief. It's complicated, I replied. But the truth is, your mom and I haven't been happy for a long time. We think it's best for everyone if we go our separate ways. Rob, usually the quieter of the two, spoke up. What about Lily? How's she taking it? She's, struggling, I admitted. But we're doing everything we can to make sure she's okay. It's going to be hard, but we'll get through this. The room fell silent as the boys absorbed the news. I could see the hurt and confusion on their faces, and it broke my heart to see them like this. I had always prided myself on being a good father, and now I felt like I was letting them down. Ryan shook his head. I can't believe this. Why now? Why after all these years? It's not something we wanted to happen, I said softly. But sometimes, things change. Your mom and I both agree this is the right thing to do. Neither of them responded right away. Eventually, Rob stood up and walked out of the room, clearly needing some space. Ryan stayed behind, his expression unreadable. This sucks, he finally said. I don't even know what to think right now. I know, I replied. But we're still a family, Ryan. That doesn't change. I'm here for you and Rob, no matter what. He nodded slowly before getting up and heading upstairs, leaving me alone in the living room. I had expected them to be upset, but seeing their pain firsthand made everything so much harder. The next morning, I found Lily sitting at the kitchen table, her eyes puffy from crying. I sat down next to her, unsure of what to say. Hey, I began softly. How are you doing? She didn't look at me. I don't know. I'm sorry, Lily, I said, my voice barely a whisper. 
I never wanted to hurt you. I just thought you deserved to know the truth. She finally looked up at me, her expression a mixture of sadness and confusion. I don't know what to feel. I'm mad at mom for lying to me, but I'm also mad at you for telling me. I understand, I said gently. And I'm sorry. I just didn't want you to go through life not knowing the truth. I love you, and that will never change. Lily wiped away a tear. I know. I just. I need time. I'm here whenever you're ready to talk, I said, reaching out to squeeze her hand. She didn't pull away, and for a brief moment, I felt a flicker of hope that maybe, just maybe, things would eventually be okay. As the weeks passed, the tension in the house remained thick, but we managed to maintain a semblance of normalcy. Laura and I continued with the divorce proceedings, keeping everything as civil as possible for the sake of the kids. Ryan and Rob were still processing the news, but they seemed to be adjusting, and Lily was slowly starting to open up to me again. One evening, while we were sitting at the dinner table, Ryan and Rob had excused themselves to go out with friends, and Lily had finished eating and gone to her room. It was just Laura and me left sitting with coffee, the silence between us heavy. I can't believe you told her, Laura finally said, breaking the quiet. There was a cold edge to her voice. I had to, I replied, not backing down. She deserved to know. You can't keep something like that a secret forever. Laura sighed and rubbed her temples. You think you did the right thing, but all you've done is complicate everything. Now she's hurt, confused. She didn't need this right now. And you think lying to her for the rest of her life would have been better? I asked, my frustration simmering beneath the surface. She's stronger than you give her credit for. She'll figure it out. Laura stared at me for a long moment before finally speaking again, her voice softer this time. So, what happens now, Ted? Do we just keep pretending for the next couple of years until this divorce is final? I'm not pretending, I said firmly. I've already moved out of our bedroom, and I'm working on finalizing everything with the lawyer. We need to figure out what's best for the kids and move on. Laura sighed again, clearly exhausted. And what do you expect me to do? Just go along with this. I expect you to face the consequences of your choices, I said, my voice steady but cold. I'm not interested in dragging this out any longer than it needs to be. We'll split everything fairly, make sure the kids are taken care of, and go our separate ways. Laura didn't respond. Instead, she stood up from the table and walked out of the room, leaving me alone with my thoughts. The next few months were a whirlwind of legal meetings, paperwork, and difficult conversations. Laura and I managed to agree on most things, including custody arrangements for Lily, who would split her time between us. Ryan and Rob were old enough to make their own decisions, but they seemed to be adjusting to the idea of their parents living separate lives. I sold my BMW and bought an old pickup truck to cut down on expenses, and I traded in our larger house for a smaller rental on the outskirts of town. Laura kept her car and remained in the house until we sold it, which took longer than expected, but eventually, we cleared a decent amount from the sale. We tried to keep things as normal as possible for the kids, but I knew the divorce was weighing on them, especially Lily. She had started pulling away from Laura, becoming more attached to me. We spent more time together, watching movies, going for walks, and talking about her future. She had grown into a smart, thoughtful young woman, and despite everything, I was proud of the way she was handling the situation. On Lily's 16th birthday, I wanted to do something special for her. When I asked what she wanted, she hesitated before finally whispering her request in my ear, she wanted her right canine tooth pulled. The same tooth that had made her smile resemble Kevin so much. At first, I wasn't sure how to feel about it, but I could tell how important it was to her. So, I arranged for it. The dentist did an excellent job, removing the tooth without leaving a noticeable gap. Lily was thrilled, and though there was a small sore spot on her gum, the dentist assured us it would heal perfectly. When Laura found out, 
she was furious. She didn't speak to me for an entire week, but I didn't care. This was something Lily had wanted, and I was glad I could give it to her. Watching her smile, free of that haunting reminder of Kevin, made it worth every bit of tension with Laura. The weeks following Lily's birthday were a mix of relief and frustration. Laura remained distant, still fuming over the decision to pull Lily's tooth, but I stood by it. It was one of the few things I could do to help my daughter feel more comfortable in her own skin. She seemed lighter, happier even, and that was all that mattered to me. I had also started noticing some changes in myself. After months of working at the feed mill, I had lost nearly 30 pounds. The physical labor, though grueling at first, had become almost therapeutic. The soreness that had plagued me in the early weeks was gone, replaced with a strange sense of pride. My clothes fit differently, and I could even see the faint outlines of abs when I looked in the mirror. It felt good, even if it was a small victory amidst the chaos of my personal life. Lily and I became closer as the months went on. She had started her senior year of high school, and we were spending more and more time together. She often confided in me, something I cherished. She seemed to be pulling further away from Laura, though. Their relationship, once close, had grown strained since Lily learned the truth about her parentage. I didn't push her to talk to her mother, understanding that their bond had been broken by lies that were hard to forgive. One afternoon, out of the blue, I noticed something strange about Laura. She had gone from being sullen and withdrawn to almost disturbingly cheerful. She was bouncing around the house, humming to herself like she hadn't a care in the world. After a few days of this odd behavior, I decided to ask Lily if she knew what was going on. What's going on with your mom? I asked casually one evening while we were watching TV. Lily made a face, clearly uncomfortable with the question. I'd rather not talk about it. Come on, you can tell me, I said, pressing her just a little. She sighed and rolled her eyes. She's acting like that because she found out that Monica Whitmer has terminal cancer. The doctors say she only has a few months left to live. I stared at her, confused. And that's why your mom is so happy. Lily nodded, disgust evident in her voice. Yeah, she's thrilled. I think it's horrible. Monica never did anything to her, but mom's gloating because she thinks it's karma for the affair. I sat there in stunned silence. The idea that Laura would find joy in someone else's tragedy, especially someone like Monica, made me sick to my stomach. It was one thing to be angry about the past, but to gloat over someone's impending death. That was a new low, even for her. That's, that's awful, I finally managed to say. I know, Lily replied, shaking her head. I don't even want to be around her right now. I didn't blame her. Laura's behavior was unsettling, to say the least. Over the next few days, I tried to avoid her as much as possible. She was too busy reveling in her twisted sense of victory to notice much, and I found solace in spending more time with Lily. We started going out more often, sometimes just wandering around a mall or catching a movie. Anything to stay away from the house. About three weeks later, the inevitable happened. I was served with divorce papers. I wasn't surprised, but the reality of it still stung. By this time, Lily was only a few months away from turning 18, so custody wasn't really an issue. Ryan and Rob were in college, and they were mostly focused on their own lives, so the logistics of the divorce weren't as complicated as they might have been. We no longer owned the house, and there wasn't much money left in the bank. Laura didn't ask for alimony or support, which was a relief. It was a straightforward incompatibility divorce, and I signed the papers as they were. The end of our marriage was official, and for the first time in months, I felt a strange sense of closure. With the divorce finalized, I knew it was time to make some bigger changes in my life. I quit my job at the feed mill, knowing it was never a long-term solution. I needed a fresh start, and luckily, my old company, Everline Technologies, was willing to have me back. They offered me a role overseeing a new European operation based out of Lisbon, 
Portugal. It was a perfect opportunity to not only restart my career but also get a much needed distance from the chaos that had consumed the past few years of my life. I spent my last day at the feed mill clearing out my locker and saying goodbye to the few people I had gotten to know. It wasn't an emotional departure, I hadn't formed any real bonds there, but it still felt like the end of a strange chapter. Afterward, I met with my bosses at Everline and signed the paperwork for my new position. The next few days were a whirlwind of preparations. I needed to get my affairs in order, clear out my bank accounts, and make arrangements for the move. Lily wasn't happy about my decision to move to Portugal, but she understood that I needed the change. She was close to finishing high school and had already made plans to go to college near Philadelphia, so it wasn't like I would be leaving her in the lurch. Ryan and Rob were supportive as well, though they were more focused on their own paths. One of the last things I did before leaving was sell off some personal belongings. I traded in my old Ford pickup for something smaller and more practical for the city streets of Lisbon. I also quietly sold off a collection of guns and coins that I had been keeping for years. I didn't need those things where I was going, and the money would come in handy for my fresh start. With the house already sold and everything else packed up, I boarded a plane and flew across the Atlantic to begin my new life. I was nervous but hopeful. It was the clean break I needed. When I arrived in Lisbon, I was blown away by how beautiful the city was. Everline had set me up with a stunning villa perched on a hillside overlooking the harbour. It was more than I had expected, luxurious, with sweeping views of the water and plenty of space to start over. I enrolled in Portuguese language classes and began getting to know the team I would be working with. For the first time in years, I felt like I was in control of my own life again. My new role as VP of Continental Operations came with more responsibility and a substantial pay increase. The company had reinstated my retirement plan, and I had access to all the benefits I had worked so hard for during my years with them. It felt good to be back on track. I stayed in contact with Lily, Ryan, and Rob regularly, updating them on my life in Portugal. Lily, who had been struggling for a while after the truth about her parentage was revealed, seemed to be doing better. She was focused on finishing high school and making plans for the future. We spoke often, and though the distance between us was hard at times, I felt like our relationship was stronger than ever. A few months after settling into my new life, I received an unexpected phone call. It was from Frank, Lily's new husband. He sounded excited and wanted to share some big news with me. Ted, I just wanted to let you know that Jenny and I are expecting a baby. Frank's voice was filled with joy. I smiled, feeling a warmth in my chest. That's amazing news, Frank. I'm so happy for you both. Thanks, Ted. We're really excited. We were thinking of coming to visit you in Lisbon after the baby is born. We'd love for you to meet your grandchild. I would love that, I replied. Whenever you're ready, just let me know, and I'll make all the arrangements. I can't wait to meet the little one. The thought of becoming a grandfather brought a new sense of purpose to my life. Even though Lily wasn't my biological daughter, I had always considered her my own, and now she was starting a family of her own. The news of becoming a grandfather gave me something positive to look forward to. My life in Lisbon had settled into a comfortable routine, and I was thriving in my new role at Everline. But the idea of visiting Lily and Frank, or having them visit me, brought a sense of excitement that I hadn't felt in a long time. A few months later, I received an invitation to Lily and Frank's baby shower, but unfortunately, I couldn't attend. My work commitments and the distance made it impossible to fly back to the States at that time. However, I sent them a gift and made sure to stay in touch as the due date approached. One sunny afternoon, while I was sitting on the balcony of my villa, enjoying the view of the harbor, my phone rang. It was Lily. Dad, I have someone I'd like you to meet, she said excitedly. I could hear the joy in her voice and smiled to myself. Is the baby here? Yes. A little girl. We named her Grace. She's perfect, 
Dad, absolutely perfect. My heart swelled with pride. I'm so happy for you, Lily. How are you feeling? Tired, but good. Frank's been amazing through everything. I really wish you could be here to meet her in person. I'll be there as soon as I can, I promise. And when you're ready, you're all welcome to come to Lisbon. I'd love to have you and Frank and Grace here. I think that sounds wonderful, she replied. We'll plan a trip once things settle down with the baby. Over the next few weeks, Lily sent me pictures of Grace, and I marveled at how beautiful she was. Seeing the photos reminded me of when Lily was a baby herself. Even though she wasn't biologically mine, I had always considered her my daughter, and now, looking at her own child, I felt the same deep connection to Grace. Life continued smoothly for the most part, but one day, I received another unexpected phone call, this time from two men I didn't recognize. They introduced themselves as detectives and said they needed to speak with me regarding a case. Mr. Marshall, we're investigating a matter that involves Anthony Donato, and we understand there may be a connection through your son-in-law, Frank. My heart skipped a beat. Frank's uncle, Anthony Donato, had always been a bit of a mystery, and I had heard whispers about his involvement in some unsavory activities. But I had no idea what this could mean for Frank and Lily. I don't know much about Anthony Donato, I replied cautiously. I've met him a couple of times at family gatherings, but I'm not involved in anything related to him. The detective nodded. We understand that. We're not suggesting you're involved, but we thought it was important for you to know that Donato has been under investigation for organized crime activities. There's a possibility that some of his business dealings might affect your family. We just want to make sure you're aware. I felt a cold knot form in my stomach. Is Frank involved in this? We're not sure at this point, the detective replied. We're looking into all potential connections. But given the circumstances, we wanted to keep you in the loop. After the detectives left, I sat in silence, trying to process what this could mean. I had never trusted Anthony Donato, but I had hoped his shady dealings wouldn't impact Lily and Frank's lives. Now, I wasn't so sure. The last thing I wanted was for them to get caught up in something dangerous, especially with a newborn baby to protect. I decided not to tell Lily just yet. I didn't want to worry her until I had more information. But the weight of the situation hung over me, and I knew I would have to confront Frank about it sooner or later. A week later, I invited Frank to meet me in Lisbon. He agreed, and a few days later, he arrived at my villa, looking happy but slightly concerned, as if he knew something was wrong. After some small talk, I finally brought it up. Frank, there's something we need to talk about. I recently had a visit from some detectives. They're investigating your Uncle Anthony. Frank's expression darkened immediately. I figured this might come up eventually. Look, Ted, I don't know everything about Uncle Anthony's business. He's always been a bit secretive, but I've never been involved in any of it. I believe you, I said. But I think it's important that you stay cautious. If he's under investigation, it could cause problems for you and Lily. You need to be careful. Frank nodded, his face serious. I understand. I'll talk to Lily, and we'll figure out what to do. Frank left Lisbon a few days later, and I couldn't help but feel uneasy about everything. Though I trusted him and believed that he wasn't involved in his uncle's dealings, I couldn't shake the worry that this situation could spiral out of control. I kept in regular contact with Lily, but I hadn't yet mentioned the full extent of the investigation. I didn't want to burden her with unnecessary stress, especially with baby Grace to take care of. Several months passed, and things seemed to quiet down. Frank had reassured me that he was being cautious and keeping his distance from Anthony Donato. However, just when I thought things were settling down, I received a call from the same detectives who had visited me earlier. Mr. Marshall, we wanted to inform you that Anthony Donato has been arrested. He's facing multiple charges, including involvement in organized crime and money laundering. 
There's also evidence linking him to a car bombing that took place a few years ago. My breath caught. A car bombing? What does this have to do with my family? The detective's voice was calm but firm. We've discovered that Donato was responsible for the death of Brian Whitmer, your wife's former lover. We know this might be difficult for you to hear, but we wanted to make sure you were informed. The revelation hit me like a freight train. Brian Whitmer's death had been a mystery for years, but I had never imagined that Frank's uncle could have been involved. Suddenly, everything made sense. The tangled web of lies, betrayal, and now this, a murder tied directly to someone connected to my family. Does Frank know about this? I asked, my voice strained. We've spoken to him, the detective replied. At this point, there's no indication that he was involved in any way. But given his family ties, we're continuing to monitor the situation. We recommend that you remain cautious and stay in contact with us if you hear anything else. After the call ended, I sat in silence, trying to process the gravity of the situation. Frank had assured me that he wasn't involved, and I believed him. But knowing that his uncle had committed such a heinous act, and that it was connected to Laura's affair, left me feeling uneasy. I decided it was finally time to talk to Lily. She needed to know the truth, and I couldn't keep protecting her from it any longer. I picked up the phone and called her, my stomach twisting as I waited for her to pick up. Hi, Dad. Lily's voice was bright and cheerful, and for a moment, I hesitated, not wanting to shatter her good mood. Hey, Lily. There's something important we need to talk about, I said, my tone more serious than usual. I could hear the shift in her voice as she picked up on my concern. What's going on? It's about Frank's uncle, Anthony Donato. He's been arrested, and the detectives investigating him discovered that he's connected to the death of Brian Whitmer. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. Brian Whitmer? She finally asked, her voice uncertain. The man mom. Yes, I confirmed, not wanting to say it out loud. He was involved in a car bombing that killed Brian. Lily's voice wavered. Does Frank know? Yes. I'm sure he'll talk to you about it. I just wanted to let you know first so you're not blindsided. I can't believe this, she whispered, sounding shaken. I don't know what to think. I know this is a lot, Lily. I'm sorry you have to deal with it, but I wanted you to hear it from me. Frank's not involved, but it's still a difficult situation for all of us. Lily was silent for a while before speaking again. Thanks for telling me, Dad. I'm going to talk to Frank. I'll call you later, okay? Okay, sweetheart. Take care of yourself, and call me if you need anything. After we hung up, I couldn't help but feel like the weight of the world had just fallen onto my shoulders. Lily would have to navigate this with Frank, and I hoped their marriage would be strong enough to survive the fallout. Lily was shaken by the news, and I knew we were all in for some difficult times ahead. After our conversation, I could feel the weight of everything pressing down on me. I hated that she had to deal with this, especially now, when her life should have been filled with happiness because of grace. A few days later, Frank called me. His voice was steady but tense. Ted, I talked to Lily. She's taking it hard, but we're working through it. I'm doing everything I can to keep her and Grace away from this mess. I'm glad to hear that, I replied. You're a good man, Frank. I know this isn't easy for either of you, but I appreciate how you're handling it. Frank sighed on the other end of the line. I'm just trying to do the right thing. I never wanted any of this to touch our lives, but now it's all coming to the surface. I'm going to keep my distance from Uncle Anthony, and I'm making sure our family isn't dragged into any of it. That's all you can do, I said. Just stay strong for Lily and Grace. After we hung up, I felt a little better knowing that Frank was taking the situation seriously. He was committed to protecting his family, and that gave me some comfort. Still, 
the connection between his uncle and Brian Whitmer's death was a dark cloud hanging over all of us, and I knew it would take time to fully process what had happened. As the months went by, things began to settle down. Anthony Donato's trial was making headlines, and though the media attention was unsettling, we did our best to avoid it. Frank's job remained unaffected, and he and Lily focused on raising Grace and building their future. I visited them a few times in Philadelphia, and each visit reassured me that they were handling the situation with grace and resilience. Grace was growing into a bright and joyful little girl, and seeing her with Lily and Frank gave me hope that, despite everything, their family would remain strong. They had been through more than most, but they were still standing together, and that was what mattered most. As for me, life in Lisbon continued to be a fresh start. I kept my focus on work, and though I missed being closer to my family, I was content knowing they were safe and happy. The past few years had been filled with turmoil, but now, as I stood on the balcony of my villa overlooking the harbor, I felt a sense of peace. We had come through the storm, and now, it seemed, we were finally finding our way back to calm waters.